Merci beaucoup euh, François Klein et Michel de Galbert pour euh, euh, présenter cette, euh, cette expérience française euh, riche euh, d'enseignement, passée d'une situation de rareté à pratiquement une situation d'abondance, voire de surabondance, qui euh, nécessite des revisiter tout l'arsenal de gestion qui a été mis en place et vous avez terminé par signaler l'importance de la, de la recherche scientifique parce qu'il y a encore beaucoup d'inconnus qui permettent de, de raisonner d'une façon scientifique les dispositifs de gestion de cette espèce. Je voudrais maintenant inviter le professeur Stephen Ditchkoff de l'université Auburn de l'Alabama aux états unis Le professeur Ditchkoff est un éminent spécialiste des questions liées à la dynamique des populations d'angulés. Il a beaucoup aussi travaillé sur les questions liées à l'alimentation de, de la faune sauvage. Il conduit un travail pionnier sur l'utilisation de la contraception pour réguler la reproduction de la faune sauvage et notamment celle, euh, je vais l'appeler sanglier, mais les États-Unis ont une espèce toute particulière, c'est une espèce porcine initialement domestique et qui est devenue euh, sauvage et qui par voie de conséquence est très prolifique. Je voudrais saluer dans la salle le docteur Ahmed Hassan, l'attaché agricole à l'ambassade de, des États-Unis. Thank you very much Hassan qui nous a aidé avec euh, sa collègue Amy Freitas euh, du ministère de l'Agriculture euh, des États-Unis à Washington à organiser un concours de sélection de l'expert américain qui vient au Maroc. Donc vous avez ici, j'allais dire, la crème de l'expertise américaine. Steve, you have the floor. Mr. Minister, Mr. High Commissioner, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important meeting. Um, this is my first visit to Morocco, and I must say it is beautiful, and I hope to come back and appreciate the hospitality once again. I should mention up front uh, that you refer to this animal as the wild boar. In America, we refer to this animal as the wild pig. Um, it is the same species, but it is a, a totally different animal in some ways. Um, the wild pigs in the United States have a strong genetic influence from domestic, from domestic pigs. Uh, domestic pigs have been selectively bred to increase reproduction, and as a result, wild pigs in the United States have a reproductive rate that is two or three times greater than what we see here in Morocco or Europe. So we are dealing with a little bit different problem. Um, additionally, wild pigs are not native to, the, to North America or the United States, and as a result, we, we, our ultimate goal is to eradicate them, um, but realistically that is impossible, and so we just hope to control their growth. My presentation will be in three parts. The first part will consist of a little background of wild pigs in, in the United States. I will follow that up with a second part to discuss some of the techniques that we use to monitor populations. And then finally, I will discuss some of the options and some of the techniques that we use for controlling wild pigs in the United States. And this map depicts the, the range of wild pigs in 1982. As you can see, 
in the southern part of the country, specifically down in Florida, in Texas, and in the western part of the country in California was where our primary populations existed. Um, this was 1982. In 1988, we had had a little bit of expansion of our populations. Um, once again, it's still located primarily in Florida and Texas in the south and California in the west. However, it was around this time that hunting of pigs or hunting of wild boar became popular in the United States. And many hunters quickly learned that you could put pigs on a pickup truck or in a trailer and haul them to new areas and introduce a huntable population. And so in 2004, we found that we had pigs in about 35 states. And I don't know if you can see clearly on this slide, but um, they've expanded considerably in Texas. They're found throughout the southeast in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Most of California is, has wild pigs. Um, if you look in the bottom left of the screen, Hawaii is represented. Hawaii is full of wild pigs. And today, we have pigs in 47 of the 50 states. In many of these states on this screen, you may not be able to see, but there are little green dots that represent new populations that have been introduced for hunting reasons. The estimate of their damage due to agriculture is in excess of $1.5 billion U.S. annually. Some of the impacts that we find with wild pigs um, from an agricultural perspective, we, we have considerable damage to crops. These crops include maize, peanuts, beans, wheat, and many others. Um, we find areas such as this where an individual pig or a group of pigs will go right down a row of, of new corn or, or, a, or a new plant. Um, we have issues with uh, pasture land or range land, areas where uh, cattle and sheep are being raised. Uh, there is damage to the pastures. Additionally, in some parts of Texas, wild pigs are considered to be the second most important predator of livestock. Most ranchers don't realize that uh, they, they are consuming the newborn animals. Um, because they completely consume the animals and there are no remains that are left. There is an additional concern about the impact of wild pigs on our domestic pork industry. Um, the, as Francois mentioned earlier, uh, they, they carry considerable number of diseases. Uh, the two of major concern in the United States are pseudorabies and uh, brucellosis and there is a potential for the spread of those diseases to our domestic pork industry which could result in additional billions of dollars in damages each year. From an environmental perspective, uh, they impact water quality. Uh, they, have, they, they pose problems with, re regards to e. with regards to coliform and bacterial contamination. Uh, they cause problems with sedimentation and they cause problems with stream flow in some cases. They have impacts on local wildlife. Um, ground nesting birds such as, such as the turkey. Um, many reptiles and amphibians are negatively impacted by wild boar. And we also find them impacting many and competing with many of our native mammal populations. We have their concerns in many areas about their potential to affect our native flora, um, particularly some of our endangered, we have some endangered species in some areas that are very susceptible to damage by pigs. And there is additional concern that the rooting and damage caused by pigs creates niches and opportunities for invasive plant species, for non-native plant species to get a foothold in those areas. There are three primary techniques that are utilized to examine and monitor pigs in the United States. The first is 
the general presence or absence of the sign of pigs. Um, when I say sign, I mean tracks or rooting or damage. In the upper right corner, you see a track of a wild pig, and down in the bottom, you can see rooting or damage in a pasture area. Probably 95% of landowners and managers in the United States document the presence or absence of wild pigs in this manner. Um, it is a simple presence or absence metric. Um, they do not have the ability to quantify how many pigs are there, uh, but they're able to assess the amount of damage and possibly determine if the numbers are increasing or decreasing. And once again, this is the most common technique utilized today. On the other end of the spectrum, there are some more scientific and, and precise methods for determining the numbers of pigs in an area. Um, for example, mark recapture. Uh, mark recapture is a scientific approach that uses um, some complex mathematics to estimate the number of pigs in an area. Um, down at the bottom is a citation for one of my students' publications that discusses this technique. Um, these are techniques that are commonly used by many wildlife biologists, wildlife managers, and wildlife researchers across the globe to determine the numbers of different types of animals in an area. However, what we're beginning to find with pigs is that pi the, the behavior of pigs results in some violations of the assumptions that are made when we use these mathematics. And more and more we're coming to learn that these supposed scientific techniques for counting pigs um, are rather imprecise and are not as accurate as we had originally believed. As a result, we have uh, uh, one of my students ha has recently come up with a technique that we feel is much more simple, yet much more precise and accurate in determining the number of pigs in an area. And it's based upon the size and composition of individual sounders or group of pigs. And when I use the term sounder, I mean a group of females and their rela related young. As you can see in these pictures, there's a strong influence of domestic swine in our wild pigs. You see a wide variation in color. Um, we have brown, we have red, black, black and white spotted. Um, this enables us to take a look at pictures of pigs using remote cameras, cameras that are tied on trees and triggered remotely, um, to get a count of, to assess different, identify different groups of pigs, but also to count the number of individuals in that group based upon the coloration of those individuals and also the relative sizes and ages of those groups. And we feel that this technique has the potential to be a, fa a fairly simple yet very effective technique for getting a pretty good estimate of how many pigs are in an area. At this point, I want to discuss some of the control options for wild pigs. Um, I'm going to classify them into three or four general categories. Uh, the first is hunting. Um, and in, in hunting, there are several categories. And, and the first I'll mention is opportunistic shooting. Um, this picture is, is of me um, this past October. It was an, I, had an, I had an opportunity to go deer hunting. and. I was fortunate enough to have some pigs come past while I was deer hunting. Um, I, like many deer hunters, whenever we have the opportunity to shoot a pig, we harvest a pig. Um, however, while there may be a, a large number of pigs taken by these hunters, in most cases, uh, it doesn't have any impact on the population. Um, another technique is, is what I would call bait and shoot where hunters will go out specifically to hunt wild pigs. Uh, they will put bait in an area. And this picture here is from Texas. And there's a feeder place there specifically to attract wild pigs and for hunters to be able to shoot them. As you can see, if, if you had a weapon, there's an opportunity to shoot a lot of pigs. But in a situation like this, you would normally just kill one or two, and the remainders would run off and be smarter the next time they came in. 
Um, this technique, like the previous hunting technique, does not do a lot to control pig populations. There's a third technique that we term the Judas pig technique. Um, this is a little more advanced, um, not very common, uh, but essentially what we do is we'll put a radio collar on a pig. Um, we we're able to locate that, that, that radio collared pig using radio telemetry techniques. And this pig will then lead us to groups of pigs and allow us to identify those locations where pigs are, are in hiding. It enables us to find pigs that are less likely to come in front of normal hunters or less likely to come um, to baited sites. Um, a, a technique that is becoming more common in the United States is the use of dogs for pig hunting. Um, in these situations, these hunters will have, a, have three, four, or five dogs. Um, a couple of these dogs will be used to track the pigs, and then they will have one or two dogs that they call catch dogs that will grab a hold of the pigs and hold the pigs there for the hunter to come up. Now, I'm not quite as brave as these gentlemen. Uh, I would prefer to use a gun. Uh, these gentlemen have a little more bravado than I do, and they use a knife. Um, that is their idea of pleasure and recreation, and um, like I mentioned before, it is becoming more and more common in some parts of the country. Um, some people consider this a good thing, the popularity of the hunting of pigs in the United States, um, but in reality, it is probably not a good thing, because as this, as this sport becomes more popular, there are more and more hunters and more and more landowners that want to move pigs to new areas where they are not, and that is the reason that we find such a problem in the United States today, and we find such a growing population, and we're finding them in new areas because of hunting. In general, in the United States, Hunting is not an effective technique for controlling pig populations. The few numbers of pigs that are harvested do not reduce the population very much, and any pigs that are remaining quickly replace those individuals that were lost. In Morocco, hunting does have the potential to be a an effective solution. Because the reproduction of pigs in Morocco is much lower than what we find in the United States, the removal of one pig or two pigs or three pigs from a group can have a major impact on the growth of that group and the growth of pigs in that area. So hunting does have the potential, unlike the United States, to be an effective control technique. We have some miscellaneous techniques that we use, uh, one of which is helicopter gunning. Um, this is a technique normally employed by our U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, Wildlife Services Group. It is, very, it is common in Texas, and it is targeted in areas where they have significant problems with wild pigs. Um, they ha it, is, it is an expensive technique, but it is also very effective at reducing large numbers of pigs from areas where there is little overhead or cover with large trees. Um, I've been told that they can remove 200, 250, or 300 pigs in one day with this technique. Um, poison or toxicants is another option. Um, two poisons that I have listed here are 1080 and sodium nitrite. 1080 is commonly used in Australia and New Zealand for control of, of pigs. And sodium nitrite is, is, a, is a more recent toxicant that has been developed and it has the potential to be very effective for controlling wild pig populations or wild boar populations. The use of toxicants are, is not legal in the United States. Uh, the reason it's not legal is it is, is 
these, there, are, there are no delivery methods to ensure that these toxicants or these poisons are only targeting pigs. The, the, the diversity of, of animals that we have in the United States results in multiple different species consuming the baits that carry these poisons and as a result the potential exists to affect many other species. As a result they're not legal. As, as I mentioned helicopter hunting is effective at reducing large numbers of pigs. Um, the type of habitat that is found here in Morocco this technique could be very, very effective. The problem is it is expensive. Poisons also have the potential to be very effective. They have been effectively used in Australia and New Zealand. Um, they're not legal in the United States, but depending upon the diversity and types of animal species, that you have here in Morocco and the baits in which the poisons are incorporated, these have the potential to be very effective in targeting localized populations of pigs. Fencing is an option that is used in some areas. Um, fencing is normally used in very small selective areas and there's two types of fencing. On the right you can see a picture of standard fencing which is woven wire, and on the bottom left is electric fencing. Both of these techniques are very effective at keeping pigs out of small areas. Obviously for large areas the use of fencing can be cost prohibitive. Um, we, with regards to e either fencing type, we do have a saying in the United States is that any, is that a fence may be pig proof today but tomorrow or the next day, the pig will figure out how to get through, around, or over that fence. Um, essentially, there is no such thing as a permanent pig-proof fence. They will find a way past that fence. And I will say about electric fencing is that electric fencing can be very effective. Pigs, are, pigs tend to shy away from, from electrical fences. Trapping. Is, pro is probably the most common technique used in the U.S. to control wild pigs. Um, I'm going to describe to you two types of traps. Uh, these are box traps. Box traps are approximately one meter tall by 1.5 meters wide by, and two to three meters long. Um, they are designed to be portable in the back of a truck. Uh, they have four sides, a top and a bottom and a door. These types of traps are, are very portable, but they, are, they only have a moderate effectiveness for catching pigs. Uh, the problem is, is that they're fairly small and can, o can only hold two or three pigs at a time. As a result, in the U.S., where we're trying to catch five, ten, or fifteen pigs, we don't consider two or three pigs captured to be very effective. However, in your situation with a fairly low rate of reproduction, um, it could be a very effective technique. But what we do feel is better is the use of corral traps. Corral traps is a circular cage that could be anywhere from 5 to 15 meters across. Um, they do not have a top, which allows non-target species such as antelope to escape from the pen. Uh, they do not have a bottom, which means the pigs are more likely to walk in. And normally we use much larger doors. These two pictures, the one in the top right, shows a group of pigs that was captured. Um, and in, the, in the, the bottom left is a, is a picture of a group of pigs that is being acclimated, that we're allowing to get used to the trap. We, allow them, we tie the trap open, allow them to go in and out each night, and then we set the trap after they're used to going in and out of the trap. As I mentioned before, this is our most effective control solution. Um, when I say most effective, I mean we capture and, and remove most of our pigs using this technique. However, it is, in most cases in the United States, it has been employed incorrectly. The use of this technique has not been employed wisely. Uh, most of our pig trappers and managers approach 
pig control with the philosophy of maximizing the number of pigs that they remove, which makes logical sense. However, we've come to learn in the past two or three years that, that a more strategic approach where the goal is to make sure that you do not leave any pigs behind is a much more effective solution. Because we have found when you leave one or two or three pigs behind, they quickly replace those that you removed and you have to go back to work again. So we have, I have my graduate student has developed a new technique, a strategic trapping technique that he calls whole sound removal or whole group removal. And it is based on four premises. The first premise is that pigs are territorial. Uh, I understand that the pigs here in Morocco and in Europe do not exhibit territoriality. However, we have found that pigs in the United States are exhibiting territoriality, meaning that they use exclusive space. It's also based upon the premise, which we found in the United States, is that pigs move across the landscape very slowly. Uh, they tend to remain in one area and they do not recolonize other areas very quickly. So that when we've eliminated a group of pigs from an area, that, that area remains free of pigs because it is recolonized very slowly by the surrounding populations. So our, so our theory is that if, that if all the pigs in an area are eliminated, then there are none left to reproduce and recolonize that area. So that is, that is the basis and the premise to whole sound removal. And it is a five-step process. The first step involves surveying the population. And we do this using remote cameras or game cameras. We're able to, to, we're able to strap these to a tree, leave the camera out in the field, and you, we'll, we'll put bait in front of the camera, and we can document the individual groups or the the pigs that are coming into that area. Once we have the pictures, our goal in step two is to identify unique groups of pigs across the area and to identify all of the individuals in each group. As you can see in these three pictures, um, each group, has, has, there's different colored pigs, but more importantly, there's different numbers of pigs in each group, and there's also different sizes of pigs in each group. By looking at the sizes and the numbers, and in addition to the colors, we can identify individuals as well as entire groups. Now, most of the pigs here in Morocco are one color, but with the, by the fact that they will be, the group sizes will be different, and also the sizes of the pigs, individual pigs in each group will be different, you should be able to identify all of unique groups and all of the individuals in each group. Once we've identified the individual pigs, we construct our traps. Um, you can see this, this is a corral trap. Um, it's a little bit dark down there, um, but hopefully you can see it as a very large door. We have found that large, wide doors are very effective for, or much more effective for getting pigs into traps. Um, and we allow the pigs to become habituated to the trap, to become used to entering the trap. We may leave this, this trap tied open and continue to put bait in it for three, four weeks to allow the pigs to get used to going in the trap. And once we have pictures of all the pigs entering the trap, we will set the traps, we will set the trigger, and capture those pigs all in one group. Our goal is to capture every pig, to not leave any behind. If we have any adults, that we did not capture in that trap, we will turn these pigs loose. Um, pigs are one of the most intelligent